everything inside me. Internet communication has gone from emails, messaging boards, and chat rooms, to sophisticated, all-pervasive networking. Social media companies build addictiveness into their products. The longer you spend on their sites and apps, the more data they generate. The more data, the more accurately they anticipate what you'll do next and for how long. The better their predictions, the more money they make by selling your attention to advertisers. Depressed and insecure about their value as human beings, the younger generations grow up knowing only digital imprisonment. Older users are trapped in polarized bubbles of political hate. As usual, the rich and powerful are the beneficiaries. Humans are social animals. But big business wants us isolated, distracted, and susceptible to marketing. Using techniques based on classical conditioning, social media programmers bridge the gap between corporate profits and our need to communicate, by keeping us simultaneously isolated and networked. The Russian psychologist, Ivan Pavlov, 1849-1936, pioneered research into conditioned reflexes, arguing that behavior is rooted in the environment. His work was followed by the Americans John B. Watson, 1878-1958, and B. F. Skinner, 1904-1990. Their often cruel conditioning experiments, conducted on animals and infants, laid the basis for gambling and advertising design. As early as the 1900s, slot machines were designed to make noises, like bell sounds, to elicit conditioned responses to keep the gambler fixed on the machine, just as Pavlov used a bell to condition his dogs to salivate. By the 1980s, slot machines had incorporated electronics to advantage particular symbols, whilst giving the gambler the impression that they are near victory. Stop buttons gave the gambler the illusion of control. Sandy Parakilas, former platform operations manager at Facebook, says, social media is very similar to a slot machine. Psychologist Watson's experiments set into motion industry-wide change in TV, radio, billboard, and print advertising that continued to develop until the present, says historian Abby Bartholomew. Topics included emotional arousal in audiences, for example, sexy actress, buy the product, Brand loyalty, for example, Disney is your family. And motivational studies, for example, buy the product, look as good as this guy. Many of these techniques involve stimulating so-called feel-good chemicals like dopamine, endorphins, oxytocin, and serotonin. These are released when eating, exercising, having sex, and engaging in positive social interactions. Software designers learned that their release can be triggered by simple and unexpected things, like getting an email, being friended, seeing a retweet, and getting a like. The billionaire co-founder of Facebook and Napster, Sean Parker, said that the aim is to give you a little dopamine hit every once in a while, because someone liked or commented on a photo or a post. But Parker also said of his company, God only knows what it's doing to our children's brains. Facebook's former vice president of user growth, Jamath Palihapitiya, doesn't allow his children to use Facebook, and says, we have created tools that are ripping apart the social fabric. Tim Cook, the CEO of the world's first trillion-dollar company Apple, on whose iPhones the addictions mainly occur, bluntly said of his young relatives, I don't want them on a social network. With the understanding that the biggest companies in Silicon Valley have been in the business of selling their users, technology investor, Roger McNamee, social media designers built upon the history of behaviorism and game addiction, to keep users hooked. For example, in the good old days, sites including the BBC and YouTube, had page numbers, pagination, which gave users a sense of where they were in their search for an article or video. If the search results were poor, the user knew to skip to the last page and work backwards. But pages were phased out and replaced with Infinite Scroll, a feature designed in 2006 by Oz Raskin of Jawbone and Mozilla. 
Pagination, for instance, gives the user a stopping cue. Designers have systematically removed stopping cues. Likening infinite scroll to behavioral cocaine, Raskin said. If you don't give your brain time to catch up with your impulses, you just keep scrolling. Before I continue the video, please give a like if you've learned something. And, don't forget to subscribe, and also, click the notification bell too, so you won't miss any update. And, watch to the end, to avoid misunderstanding. Thank you. Users think that they have control over their social media habits, and the information being fed to them, including news and suggested web pages, are coming to them organically. But, unbeknownst to them, the framework is calculated. The US Deep State, for instance, helped to develop social networks. Sergey Brin and Larry Page developed their web crawling software, which they later turned into Google, with money from the US Defense Research Projects Agency. Referring to the massive digital data systems, the CIA-funded Dr. Bhavani Theresingham confirmed that the intelligence community's MDDS program essentially provided Brin seed funding. Consider how the technologies were commercialized. Growth means advertising money accrued from sites visited, content browsed, links clicked, pages shared, etc. Growth hackers are described by former Google design ethicist Tristan Harris as engineers whose job is to hack people's psychology so they can get more growth. Designers build applications into software that manipulate users' unconscious behavioral cues to lead them in certain directions. To give an example, the feel-good chemical oxytocin is released during positive social interactions. It is likely stimulated when social media companies send an email alert that family have shared a new photo. Other human foibles include novelty seeking, for potential rewards, and temptation, fear of missing out, or FOMO. These are linked to the feel-good chemical dopamine. Rather than including the new family photo in the email, the email is designed with a URL feature to tempt the user to click the link, which directs them to the social media site, in order to see the new photo. This convoluted chain of events is designed to sell the user's attention to advertisers. The more time spent doing these things, the more adverts can be directed at the user and the more money for the social media company. Harris says, you are being programmed at a deeper level. In addition, tailored psychological profiles of users are secretly built, bought from, and sold to data brokers, like Experian. User behavioral patterns feed deep learning programs, which aim to predict the user's next online move according to their personal tastes and previous browsing patterns. The more accurate the prediction, the more likely their attention is drawn to an advert, and the more money social media firms accrue. Says former Mozilla's Raskin. They're competing for your attention. He asks. How much of your life can we get you to give to us? Instagram was developed in 2010 by Facebook as a photo and video sharing service. It is used by a billion people globally, and, unlike the teen-loving Snapchat, is used mainly by 18 to 44-year-olds. Instagram falls into the so-called painkiller app category. One designer explains that such apps typically generate a stimulus, which usually revolves around negative emotions such as loneliness or boredom. In addition to the harmful content of social media, sexualized children, impossible and ever-changing beauty standards, cyberbullying, gaming addiction, loss of sleep, etc., the very design of social media hurts young users. We all need to love ourselves and to feel loved by a small circle of others, friends, family, and partners. Young people are particularly susceptible to self-loathing and questioning whether someone loves them. The introduction of social media has been devastating. A third of all teens who spend at least two hours a day on social media, in other words, the majority, have at least one suicide risk factor. The percentage increases to nearly half for those who spend five hours or more. A study of 14-year-olds found that those with fewer social media likes than their peers experience depressive symptoms. Teens who are already victimized at school or within their peer group were the worst affected.
To beat the antisocial social network, we need to remember who we are, and what real communication is. We need to protect the young from the all-pervasive clutches of social media, and to realize, that we are being sold. Ask yourself. Do you use social media solely to organize protests, alert friends to alternative healing products, and spread anti-war messages? Or do you use it to send irrelevant information about your day-to-day -day habits, in anticipation that an emoji or like will appear? Taking a step back, can allow us to see outside, and indeed prick the bubble of digital hatred, in which the deep state and corporate sectors have imprisoned us. Comment below with more topic ideas for me to discuss. As a lot of care and hard work goes into this, likes and subscribe, let me know I'm doing a good job. All is appreciated greatly. You may not agree with everything from the content I post. Apply critical thinking and use discernment to come to your own conclusions regarding the content. Thanks for watching this video. This everything inside me channel, see you on the next video. Stay safe and healthy.